<laughs> well, I'll just uh, say, uh, in, in conclusion this, to this morning, <laughs> I would just like to... <laughs> yeah, we have fun, you can tell, can't you? You know, Loretta just pointed out something, you know, it's just about uh, touching heaven. You know, each one of us have been given a great privilege in earth, in, in, in this life, and that is to be able to touch God. Uh, and that's, that's the purpose why Jesus came, isn't it? That we would be able to have, once again, to have access to the Lord. But sometimes I think that we, that we, um, we don't, I think we underestimate the authority and the power and the ability that God has placed inside each and every one of us. So much so that we, we don't access that which God has given to us. Remember the story whenever the, when God created man and the angels asked the Lord. I think this is very interesting. Very few times do you find the angels asking God anything. But when, they, when God created man, the angels asked God the question. They said, what is man that you would be mindful of him? You know, we, we put it sometimes, I think, like, what is man? You know, I mean, kind of like a hip-hop angel. Yo, what is man? Uh, the, that you, you know, it's like, he's no big deal. But I think really it was read this way. What is man? What, what is this that you have created that you would be mindful of him, that you would pay attention to him? Up until this time, angels had seen all of God's creation. And up until this point, all of creation drew to God to spend time with him. Yet God creates this thing and puts it in the garden and God goes down to meet with man. And so the response of the angels was, what is man? That you pay attention to him. You know, the Bible says this, the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. This earth is what you and I make it out to be. Oh God, you just handle it. Oh God, you just take care of it. Listen, God's looking at us saying, you do it. I have given you the earth, rule, have dominion, dominate this blue ball. He's given it into our hands to do something with. And so we have been invested with power from on high to change the world. And I believe that we can change the world. Even in the very beginning, you know, when I think about the first man, when I think about Adam, and I think most of us think this way, when God put him in the garden, typically in our mind we see God placing him in a, a beautiful paradise. Am I, are you with me on that? What, when you think of the Garden of Eden, give me a... Give me an idea. What does it look like to you? Vacation. vacation. <laughs> like a vacation. You know where Pastor went too, don't you? Uh, is, any, is anyone else giving another, something else? Waterfalls. Waterfalls mountains, mountains. Hawaii. Hawaii. Yeah, good stuff like that. Yeah. This is, this is, what, this is what it looked like. However, I want us to look at uh, a verse of Scripture here in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 1, we know God tells the story of how he created everything. On, on day 1, he did this. On day 2, he did this. On day 3, and so on and so forth. But then in chapter 2, he explains more of the details on how all that stuff actually took place. And one thing I find very interesting is that when we look at chapter 2, we find out that truly, and for years I always think my, in my mind the Garden of Eden was the same thing. However, in chapter 2, he actually tells us or shows us what the garden really looked like when he put Adam in it. And I find it very interesting. In chapter 2, verse, we start reading here, verse number 3, And God sanctified the seventh, and blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because it was on that day he rested from all of his work which God had, had made. Verse number 4, And these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. Verse 5, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth. Everybody say, before. before. Notice that. Every plant of the field before it was in the earth. And every herb, or herb, depending on where you're from, of the field. Everybody say this next word. Before it grew. So God has an earth, yet he already has the plants, and he already has all the herbs before they were actually put into the earth. For the Lord had not yet caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. So what did the earth look like when God created it? It was a big ball of dust. 
There were no plants. There were no herbs until God first put a man in place. In other words, God said, I have got a wonderful creation, a wonderful plan. However, C and, Ken and, C and Kentral, key and central to... <laughs> See and control to everything that I do revolves around man. So I'm going to cause man to be the center of the very creation. So he has a ball of dirt, uh, puts a man in it, and around man grows every green and every living thing. God has put into us the power and the authority of his spirit. And without God's power and authority, we have nothing and can do nothing and so forth. And I know that I grew up hearing all the time saying, without God, we can do nothing. And that's true. But praise God, we're not without Him. Amen. So we don't need to be focusing on what we don't have, but on what we do have. And we're not without Him. We are with Him. As Loretta said, we're seated with Him in heavenly places. So from that place, we begin to rule and reign and execute our authority in the earth. The heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given into the hands of the children of men. What are we going to do with it? And we have the ability to do something with this earth. Go with if you would, please. And now I'll get to the message I came up here to preach before I was so wonderfully distracted. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. And we're going to look at some verses here that I think we all know very well. We could all, all, probably all quote. This is known as the Great Commission. It's called that because it's not the Great Suggestion. God didn't suggest this is something that we do. He commanded that this is something that we should do. Have you ever noticed most people don't like to be told what to do? Is that just me or is that just us in Scotland? Have you noticed that? Most people don't like to be told what to do. Everybody wants a Savior, but very few people want a Lord. And the Lord tells you what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. It's not that we get part of the package, we get born again, yet we don't receive the Lordship of Jesus in our life. No, you receive both. He's Savior and Lord, or He's neither one of them. He has to be both in your life. Which means he rules, he gets a salvation, but he rules and reigns. He tells you what you're supposed to do. Listen, when I was bought with the price, I didn't decide. When I was bought with the price, that means I no longer belong to myself anymore. I've been bought. I belong to someone. These shoes belong to me. I tell them when they're going with me and when they don't. Actually, I don't tell them because that would be really weird to talk to your shoes. But you understand what I mean. I own these things, so therefore I, I use them as, as I will. I don't ask them their opinion. Hey, brown shoes. How do you think you would look with my gray suit? Because they would always say yes, because they want to go with me everywhere I go. That's not in the... What? But my wife would say no. The brown shoes may not go. <laughs> Here we go. With the gray suit. With the gray suit, yeah. Right. Verse 18 of the last chapter of the book of Matthew. And Jesus came and spake unto his disciples, saying, All power. Everybody say all power. Bing. All power. Not some or most, but all power has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. So Jesus tells us here that we are to go into all the world and preach the gospel. This is what we call the Great Commission, of course. And I like to look at it this way. The last words of Jesus have become the first priority of the church. The last thing he spoke to us is the first thing he wants me to do. So everything about our life and about our ministries, and it doesn't matter to me whether you're a church or you're an independent ministry or what you are, everyone's vision should be the same. Everybody will have a different way of manifesting or expressing that, but everybody's vision is the same. Reach the world with the gospel. Yes. 